welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School. I'm Minister Cedric Harden and I'll be presenting Lesson 1 for March the 5th, 2023. We begin a new unit today, Unit 1, entitled Called from the Margins of Society. And our topic for today, taken from our adult quarterly, is Love in Difficult Times. Our devotion reading is taken from Psalm 28. Our background script is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And we'll be studying today uh, as a part of our lesson, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Our key verse reads, The Son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 verse 21 from the NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to evaluate how and why the actions of the Father exceeded the expectations of Jesus' listeners. Secondly, to confront your resistance to the receiving of grace and forgiveness. And then thirdly, to give thanks for an occasion in which you receive grace that exceeded your expectations. We have three outlines today that will be a part of our lesson. The first outline is entitled, A Foolish Son's Request. Our second outline is entitled, uh, A Foolish Son Repents. And then the third outline is entitled, A Father's Unconditional Love. We certainly thank and praise God for yet this another opportunity to be able to share uh, in the study of God's Word. And we, we always encourage you uh, to follow along with us. Uh, you will need a Bible. Uh, you will need something to take some notes. And we certainly hope that you are encouraged by our Sunday School lessons and we hope that you are strengthened uh, in your faith uh, as we seek to walk with our Savior. We have quite a bit of ground to cover and I want to begin with our biblical context for this lesson. Uh, Luke is the only Gentile to compose any books of scripture and so he is the recognized author of the gospel that bears his name. We don't know a lot about, uh, about Luke, about his life, uh, because it, he includes no details about his background or conversion to Christianity. Uh, but what we do know, <clears throat> if we study the gospel of Luke, is that Luke acknowledged that he uh, acquired the content of for his gospel account from eyewitnesses. Uh, the result is accepted as reliable, trustworthy, and infallible because of God's divine inspiration and providence. Uh, Luke meticulously recorded many details of Jesus' uh, life uh, that are omitted from the other gospels. But the central theme is the account is his account is Jesus compassion for those on the margins of Jewish society uh, we're talking about sinners Gentiles women children uh, and tax collectors but we want to pay close attention to chapter 15 where Luke's uh, Luke provides a dramatic illustration of his compassionate love for the lost in heaven's joy when one is found and reconciled uh, to God and so we want to make sure that uh, I'm sure you've read this parable of the prodigal son uh, and I'm sure you've heard many messages uh, concerning uh, certain application of this parable we want to make sure that we understand what a parable is um, and and why it's necessary I like to think of parables as a style of teaching, if you will, and certainly in terms of uh, how Jesus used this particular approach uh, in his ministry. But by definition, uh, parables are stories, especially those of Jesus told to provide a vision of life 
uh, especially life in God's kingdom. So uh, the structure of a parable means of putting aside or alongside for purposes of comparison and new understanding. Uh, parables utilize pictures such as metaphors or uh, similes to uh, and frequently extend um, into a brief story to make a point or a particular disclosure. And so, uh, but I want to just uh, go to Luke chapter 14. When you study uh, these particular parables, particularly in ja uh, chapter 15 of Luke, I would encourage you to go back to Luke chapter 14. And I want to do that briefly before we get into these outlines. Uh, this is not a part of our printed text, but I think it's relevant to understand uh, what what's happening in, in the day and the world of this text. Uh, but I want you to look with me at Luke chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. And I want to read this because this is where the parables begin to take shape uh, according to Luke's gospel and according to Jesus' ministry. The Bible says, chapter 14 of Luke, Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, uh, that they watched him closely. Verse 2, And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Verse 3, And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That's sort of the context of, of who Jesus' uh, audience is and why he is choosing to use parables at this time. And then I want you to look at Luke chapter 15. Again, this is not a part of our printed text, but I think it's relevant in terms of our discussion. Luke chapter 15, I want to read verses 1 through 3. The Bible says in chapter 15, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to, uh, near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, and then it goes on to talk about the lost sheep. And so we want to uh, uh, understand here that uh, there are uh, different types of parables, obviously, in the Gospels, but this is Jesus' special uh, use of these parables uh, and he used them to answer his religious critics right so so these uh, answering parables usually for Pharisees and sinners simultaneously expose and extol right so Jesus exposed the self-righteousness of his critics and extolled the kingdom of God so these uh, three other instances or uh, uh, three instances of parables that Jesus used uh, uh, to silence his critics or to answer his critics. The other, uh, I would encourage you to look at Matthew chapter 11 verses 16 through 19 and then Luke chapter 7 uh, verses 31 through 35 and then our printed text today, Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32. So when when we encounter rejection, right, as Jesus did, what do we do? How do we address that? Uh, and so and I want you to, to, to pay close attention here. These uh, 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 series of parables, if you will, Jesus is addressing an audience who has uh, misinterpreted the word of God or the law uh, they have misinterpreted his purpose uh, uh, in ministry and who he uh, uh, associates with. Uh, and so I want you to have some framework as we get into these outlines that Jesus is addressing uh, people who are uh, 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 have a particular uh, conviction about who they are and and what they believe and and they are criticizing 
uh, Jesus Christ for his association with those of uh, what we would call marginalized society. And, uh, and lastly, uh, this is a principle that we teach in evangelism that association is a method of evangelism, right? Uh, we cannot evangelize the gospel. We cannot spread the gospel if we refuse to associate with certain people. We will only evangelize with, with those in a different bracket. And then those of marginal uh, circumstances, if you will, are those who uh, 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 society has discarded. Uh, we don't want to share our faith with them and this is what's happening here uh, but I want I want to and we will, we will look at this as we go along and provide some context for tax collectors and sinners what does that mean in this context uh, uh, why are we categorizing individuals as sinners why is it happening in this text uh, that Jesus is sharing these parables so Let's begin with the prodigal son. Uh, um, uh, the first outline is entitled, A Foolish Son's Request. Uh, this is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 16. And I want to read this um, from the NIV translation. The Bible says, verse 11, Jesus continued. What that means is that he continued to share parables, right? There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, uh, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Verse 14, and then after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine uh, in that whole country and he began to be in need verse 15 so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs verse 16 says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. So now we have the task of trying to pull apart uh, some application, right, for this particular parable. What does it mean? Um, uh, it's a story, right, as we shared earlier. Uh, it's a story, it's, it's putting alongside a, a, a particular matter to provide some understanding I want you to think about Jesus coming into the world what is he trying to do what is his mission uh, why is he sharing these types of stories uh, this style using this style of teaching uh, uh, we have to and we should think more broadly uh, about this particular passage or in all of these uh, uh, parables if you will there is much depth to these individuals uh, as Jesus is talking about them um, and Jesus is trying to get across uh, a message a divine inspired message to those who are criticizing him who are murmuring against him they are uh, uh, they are not receptive to him and so how can he get them to think more in line or in terms with the kingdom of God how do how does Jesus address this right and so it's masterful in helping us understand uh, 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 that 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 there is a need there is an issue here uh, 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 that Jesus wants to get across to folks who he knows uh, uh, in his heart and in his mind these individual uh, in uh, uh, that that are murmuring and complaining and mocking him they need to be saved right they are devoid of a relationship with Jesus Christ and so he has to tell them a story so 
the theme of Luke 15 is the loss that uh, represents three parables that I, I gave you earlier to, to give you some reference that Jesus told in response to the murmuring of the Pharisees and the scribes against his reception of and fellowship with sinners right what does that word mean but in this context and how and why we have this classification is is that sinners were people who were immoral or who followed occupations that the scribes held to be incompatible with keeping uh, God's law the rabbinic rule stated that one must not associate with an ungodly man and the rab and the rabbis would not even teach such a person right notice that chapter 14 ends with let him hear and chapter 15 begins with these sinners gathering to hear Jesus so so these this classification uh, uh, of of people here these sinners uh, uh, Jesus wants these individuals to know that the kingdom of God does not consider people the way we do right we marginalize we put people in particular categories and 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 then we don't want to associate with certain people who we feel are less than who we are and this was the custom and the practice uh, uh, and so these individuals that, that have been put on the shelves, if you will, and are not addressed uh, because of their occupation, they, don't, uh, they, they are not even taught, right? The rabbis refuse to teach them, right? So the uh, religious establishment rejected Christ and the salvation he offered while the outcasts of society were drawn to hear uh, to him and his message of salvation. So each parable's undergirding message is God's love for all of humanity and his desire that all are reconciled to him. So when we think about this, this third parable or the prodigal son or the lost son, it illustrates the foolishness or the folly of sin and and God's great salvation this uh, 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 this story if you will has some depth uh, in terms of, of, of how we uh, 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 can be foolish in in life foolish in behavior foolish in conduct uh, not realizing that we need to be saved but Jesus uh, begins this parable with the younger of two sons requesting to share uh, his share of their father's estate and receiving the uh, he he received it right there's some biblical reference in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 21 verse 17 that you could look at at your leisure so uh, Jesus did not explain why the younger wanted his inheritance now however his request mirrors the mindsets a uh, uh, mindset of all sinners who disregard their spiritual potential by refusing a relationship with Jesus Christ we have all acted in this way right we've all been down this road if you will if you're saved you've been down this road where you thought you uh, uh, had the world uh, uh, by the tail that you could do you could live uh, uh, however you wanted to live and you could do all that you wanted to do and uh, uh, but but the Bible is helping us to understand that it's foolish it's foolish to us to engage in such a reckless lifestyle not considering the fact that we were created in the image and the likeness of God and there is value to our lives there's a value attached to your presence on this earth and that needs to be probed right we need to understand why we are on this earth and we need to pursue that from God's perspective but this is not and this is something this this son that wants all of his portion and how reckless he is represents people's nature right look at the Pharisees look at the scribes are they 
acting like this young man? Is this a part of their human nature that they are disregarding the potential? Why are these individuals mocking Jesus? Why are they murmuring? Why are they complaining? Why are they criticizing him for associating with people who need to be saved? This is what they should be doing, right? If you are a rabbi, why are you refusing to teach uh, 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 people uh, certainly that, that you feel are not in your classification or they don't measure up? Why won't you teach them? So this is the kind of recklessness that we have engaged in and that Jesus came to save us from, right? So verse 13 provides a clue to the young man's ulterior motive. After receiving his portion, he took all he had, he left home, he traveled to a far country, he squandered it with a prodigal or reckless living. His actions uh, encompass wasteful, extravagant uh, living and involve promiscuous uh, immorality. So this young man in this context foolishly wasted his inheritance about the same time that a famine occurred and he found himself watch this he was broke he was destitute and more importantly he was in need and sometimes uh, as we think about uh, 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 this particular lesson I just want to hone in on this context here about these Pharisees they have not addressed what they need they have not addressed the internal uh, 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 portion of their lives, their soul, if you will. They have not even addressed this in terms of needing. They have a need, right? They, they think they are better off than they really are, right? They may have means, but they're broke spiritually, right? They may have friends, but they're destitute in terms of being in a relationship uh, with God and so they are in need right so to add to this deplorable condition uh, he had to work this young man in this in this story here in this parable had to work for a foreigner feeding swine for a Jew this occupation was among the most degrading and detestable now, you know we're getting very close to shouting material when we see where the Lord have brought us from because he came to save uh, this situation that we were in and this is as Jesus tells this story the Pharisees the scribes the the, the those who are listening should be thinking about where they are right when the message goes forward we should be thinking about ourselves we should be thinking about looking in the mirror of who we are and what we are in terms of the Word of God and asking ourselves do we need the Savior do we need help so physically morally and spiritually this foolish young man was at his lowest nevertheless extreme hunger tempted him to eat what uh, he fed the swine right this is a horrible situation but Jesus used this young man this story this parable to symbolize the utter helplessness and despairing condition of sinners estranged from God so the 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 the, the definition here that I gave you concerning sinners when we think about that today we want to think about rebelling against God this is what this uh, prodigal son uh, was essentially doing he was rebelling for in uh, from instruction he wanted his own so he could be on his own he wanted no structure right he he didn't want any discipline in his life he did not want to be restrained or constrained by the Word of God and so when we think about a, a classification of sinners in our context in our day in our culture we have to think about rebellion because that's where that's the root uh, that 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 uh, uh, sends us in a downward spiral if you will 
and how we become wasteful and reckless in our lives because we are rebelling against instruction that God gives us. God sets boundaries for our lives that we might remain alive and that we might do well in the life that he has provided and the grace that he had provided. But when we seek to rebel instruction that we don't want to do what the Lord in, uh, admonishes us to do, we don't want to live the way that the Lord wants us to live, then we run into this issue, right? Uh, we run into this story. We repeat this cycle of parable in our lives, right? But the Pharisees and the scribes criticized Jesus for associating with those they branded as sinners but failed to realize they were like that young man in this parable. That's what I said earlier. They were lost and separated from God. They desperately needed to hear the good news of salvation. They needed to repent and become reconciled to God. But here's something. The faith community is expected to emulate Jesus and position itself to attract the prodigals, right? Who are lost and point them to him for salvation. So we in turn have to sort of tell stories, if you will. Uh, uh, let me give you another word. We ought to testify. We ought to testify about the goodness of God. Uh, and so you may not have had this a uh, 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 same scenario as this uh, uh, prodigal son but you have a prodigal story you have a prodigal testimony right and you have to share that testimony with those and sometimes a good strategy of associating with people and what I love about God uh, we don't disappear from the earth when we get saved God leaves us many times in the environments where he delivered us from so we can be a witness to the place and to the people where uh, we spent a lot of our time and so God wants these individuals to see that transformation and then you and I have to turn around and testify give up a, a share a parable a, a story a something alongside uh, uh, of that theological theme that we want to be able to present some context for people to understand because they want to know what happened to you right you might remember the Apostle Paul, how he persecuted uh, the saints of God. But when the Lord delivered him, when Paul went on trial, everywhere he went, he always shared his Damascus Road experience. He always testified about the Lord, where the Lord had brought him from. He talked about his prodigal life, how he was excelling and how he was uh, 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 persecuting the church and how he was doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. This is where we have to be. And I love that about Paul. He never forgot his uh, uh, experience with Christ on that Damascus road. And so he told a parable. He told a story. He put that testimony alongside of a theological theme to help individuals understand that if God did it for me, he will also do it for you. So let's move on to the second outline. We still have uh, uh, quite a bit of ground to cover. And we want to move into the second outline entitled, A Foolish Son Repents. Uh, this is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 19 again from the NIV translation when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death verse 18 I will set out and go back to my father and say to him father I have sinned against heaven and against you verse 19 I am no longer worthy to be called your son Make me like one of your hired servants. I took a particular note to this section, um, uh, and I and I want to I want to do this biblically so we can understand here as we look at this story. I don't want us to make the mistake that we can somehow 
uh, leave God out of the process in terms of coming to ourselves and, and or repenting. What do I mean by that? In other words, when you came to Christ, I want you to know that God was involved in unctioning you and moving you to come to him. In other words, he was drawing you to him, right? Drawing me to him. And then you moved, God moved us to a place of repentance. And so as we think about this particular part uh, of this story, of this narrative here, that this son or any son cannot share in God's glory. We cannot take credit. And it sounds good, right? That you came to Jesus just as you was. You were weary, you were worn, and so on and so on. But biblically, what does the Bible say about how you came to him? And I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 42. This is just so you, to give you a pattern uh, or some framework to help you to understand that God will not share his glory with you. If you came to yourself in and of yourself, you could also share in the glory. But that's not biblical, right? So we have to be mindful that this son, even in this parable, as he seeks to go back, as he seeks to repent, is all under divine order, right? We can never come to God without God. So we are clear. We can never come to God. We can never be saved. We can never come to where we need to come to without God being involved. I gave you Isaiah 42 verse 8. I also want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. But we want to take this story right at face value. Uh, so now hungry and totally bankrupt he came to his senses right the prodigal son however it was more than feelings of re regret he accepted responsibility um, for for his actions right I also want you to look at John the gospel according to of uh, St. John chapter 6 verse 44 and also verse 65 just so you can understand here and I, and I think I will read this because I, I think that uh, many times that you know we want to be able to take the credit for where we are in our lives with Christ and how we somehow miraculously right gain some wisdom without God being involved that's just not possible biblically right John chapter 6 verse 44 I want to read this and you can look at it at your leisure right this is Jesus talking here right no one can come to me right unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day no one can come to Christ without being drawn no one and in this fashion God gets all of the glory right so we just need to understand that we need to ask for God's help Right? We need to ask God to, to lead us and to guide us. And he will. And many times God moves up on us so, so, so quickly before we know it. We are right in the place where he wants us to be. But unfortunately sin possesses the, uh, the capacity to paralyze and blind us to God in whose image we were created. So at the point of de desperation, the young prodigal changed his mind, right, about himself and his circumstances, but went a step further. He confessed 
the father's generosity that he had deserted and realized that being one of his servants was far better than where he was now so God is involved in in giving us a mind right God gives us a mind and an attitude to approach him right and then he turns around and he blesses us right but like this young man the lost must first recognize the depths of their sinfulness compared to God's holiness. I also want you to look at Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 5. God has a way of moving us, transforming us, right, and bringing us to where we need to be. But finally, the, the, the faith community must visibly and vocally demonstrate the power of God's word to transform lives and the benefits of the abundant life he offers again I, I love the component of this lesson that draws the believers the present-day believers into the conversation right about our role and how we are to emulate and respond to people who are uh, put in these marginalized categories where they are not, uh, uh, where they are not uh, being treated as God would uh, would have them to be treated, uh, uh, they are not exposed to the gospel as God would have them to be exposed. They 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 are ill treated. They are not shown the compassion and the love that Christ demonstrated when He came into this sinful world to pray to pay the ultimate price for all of our sins not just some people right and so we have to remember that Jesus died publicly right he died horribly but he died publicly he died publicly so everybody could see and everybody had access right so we need to keep those things in mind that we have a role because we see these reckless situations happening we see folk who are prodigal every day right some in our environment in our workspaces in our in our homes in our communities and we are responsible for living and saying something to them about the love of God that he came to seek and to save that which was lost right and then lost we just want to remember that you know there are many applications to that word loss but what we want to make sure that we get across to those who uh, uh, need to be saved uh, that the Bible classifies these particular individuals uh, as lost to refer to persons who have not yet found eternal life in Christ right so they 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 are lost right and we need to do all that we can demonstrating to them that 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 Jesus came not just to uh, to, to to seek them but to find them right so there's an application for us not just to, to sit and just wait on people to come to us we have to seek and we have to find right we have to discover we have to disclose the Word of God uh, to those who need to be saved or else they will follow the reality of this prodigal story which which is to come to self ruin right and you all know about recovery recovery can take a long time right it takes a lot when we're trying to get back to where we need to be there's a in other words there's a process by which we come to Christ there's a process unto salvation all right so lastly uh, we want to get to this uh, final outline entitled a father's unconditional love this is taken from Luke chapter 15 verses 20 through 24 and again from the NIV translation so he got up and went to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion. I want you to underline that if you can or mark that or write that down. Uh, this father was filled with compassion for him. 
he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Verse 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. What did he find? This prodigal son found love, right? Some things that really, really stick out to me in this lesson. People need to find the love of God, right? Not just on the outside, but they need to find it. If we have hearts that have been transformed by God, what God has done, the love that he demonstrated in us becomes an outward expression. The father here in this context is demonstrating the practical things on the outside, such as the robe, right? The ring, the sandals, the fattened calf, right? The feast. All of these are external mechanisms, right? Right? Things on the outside. But the reason why this is uh, manifesting itself in such a way because there is work that has been done on the inside. The Father, for God so loved the world, right? This is what this is what He has in Him, and what comes out of the, His love for us is His Son, right? The Father's essence is love, and what comes out of Him is a sacrifice, right? God's nature is compassion and what comes out of that is the blood of his son right his concern for us God's concern for us expresses itself or manifests itself in the cross of Jesus Christ if we miss if we miss the cross right we miss God altogether. The cross, everything that we understand about the cross should tell us about the heart of God. The only thing that he is capable of doing, if I could phrase it this way, God, is to demonstrate what he is and who he is. And he demonstrates it in, in such a fashion that we can see it. I love the first epistle of John chapter 1. You should read that. We can touch it. We can handle it. Right? It moves. It breathes. It, 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 it expresses itself in something that we can touch. Something that we can reach. And this is what we have to understand about the cross. It is for people to reach it. To touch it. Right? not just to hear it but they need to experience it and the way they experience the cross or the love of God or the manifestation or the blood of Jesus Christ is how we have been transformed this is how the cycle if you will repeats itself this is what we get from the Great Commission Jesus says teach what you have been taught right Make nations, baptizing them. Do for others as I have done for you. And in that way, we reproduce the love of God. We reproduce the essence of the cross. Right? This is something the Pharisees, if they, they're, they're excellent teachers of the Mosaic law, but they are missing the fulfillment of the law within themselves. And we know there is no transformation by the very thing that they teach because of how they act. 
All right. They should have been joining Jesus and associating with the marginalized. But they didn't do that. And that represents that there had been no transformation, even of those who say they are experts in the law. I hope, trust, and pray, saints, that I have made some sense to you today just to help you to understand that there are many applications that we could draw from this prodigal son story. I'm sure you'll hear them. But make sure we understand that it's deeper than what we think. It's broader than we could ever know. Right? The love of God has put itself on display. Right? In ways that the Pharisees and the scribes were not willing to extend themselves. They were not willing, right? They were not willing to go as far as Jesus did. And sometimes people will not get to the gospel when we are not willing to take it to them, right? So we want to remember the compassion, the love of God manifesting itself through Jesus Christ, extending itself that we could have access to it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this lesson today. You have opened up our eyes to be able to understand that you are concerned, your compassion, God, is beyond our comprehension. Your loving kindness is way over our heads. We just cannot comprehend the love that you have for us. But I pray, God, even now, that you would draw men nigh unto thee. In the mighty name of Jesus, give us a mind to seek you out. Give us a mind to see ourselves as you see us. Give us a mind to see that there is no way that we can make it without you. Help us to understand the purposes that you came, that you sent your only begotten son on this earth and shed his precious blood, gave his life, even died on the cross. But he got up on the third day with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. Somebody needs to hear this story today. We are wasting away devoid of spirit and a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are the only one, God, that can, that can connect the dots, that can give us a fullness of life, full in a relationship full of the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father, we lift up each and every family today. There are many situations, even now, even as those who would listen, that I know there's trouble on the horizon. God, but we just thank you for being a very present help in the time of trouble. And we just stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ today to, to commend this word to those who need you in a desperate way. Help us to be able to deliver the message in the cross of Jesus Christ. In a way, if we have to share a story or testimony or whatever it is that would be effective, O oh God, in the lives of your people, that they might seek you, that you might get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. God bless you, saints. Just know that I love you. I'm praying for you. I thank God for this lesson. Thank God for turning it around in your lives. Uh, we all have seen this story play out in our lives. But thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the blood that was shed at Calvary. So until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.